1909 invited Donald McMillan to join the expedition to the top of the world to plant the flag for the very first time right on the ice cap. Well, what an opportunity. Donald McMillan was beside himself with glee. He, of course, joined the uh, expedition. He was a novice to it. He, went, he got frozen feet. He couldn't do very much, but he was on one of the outstations when Peary actually went across with Henson and planted the flag on the North Pole. Well, when they got back, my God, this man, this poor McMillan, he was bit by the bug. He was bit hard by the Arctic bug. He had to go back to the Arctic. So he went north for a couple of little excursions up to Labrador and so on. And then somehow he got hooked up with National Geographic Society. They wanted an expedition to go up to find Cracker Land. When Peary was up north, he thought he saw this tremendous, this tremendous continent up there in the middle of the ice cap. And the other people claimed they had seen this kind of thing too, but nobody really knew much about it. McMillan got an expedition together and they went to the very northern part of Greenland, way above Etah, and they, they were supposed to spend a, a year up in there. The boat dropped them off and they camped way up there in the north. And in the winter time, they went out on the ice cap. They couldn't find any vestige of Crocker land. I guess it was all a myth. It was all a crock. But there was no Crocker land. But McMillan had this opportunity to stay there all the winter and live with the Eskimos. He learned their culture. He learned learns their society. He ate with them. He slept with them. He fished with them, hunted with them, and uh, learned their language. Probably nobody, no white man knew as much about the polar Eskimo uh, as Robert Mc, as uh, Donald McMillan. Anyway, the boat that was supposed to come and pick them up in another year, the weather was so bad they couldn't get there. Another year, the weather was so bad they couldn't get there. They finally got back to him in 1917. He went up there in 1913 and stayed until 1974, four years in the north living with the Eskimo. Well, my gosh, he had a lot of time to think over what he was going to do with his life. And he decided since there was so little known about the Arctic, he would have a vessel built. <clears throat> have a little schooner built. <clears throat> he could go up and he could study the Arctic, all the features, geographic features, and flora and fauna, and zoology and biology and all these ologies. And he had this, this idea in mind, this little schooner, a little 88 foot schooner that he could dodge among the ice cakes and dodge around the icebergs. And uh, the Bowden was of course the result named after his alma mater, a little 88 foot schooner made of wood so that she'd be well insulated for the dark winters up there that they're gonna spend, he had planned in the Arctic. She was built pretty ruggedly. She had a tremendous apron piece behind her stem which reinforced her stem. She had boilerplate around the bow. She had ironwood sheathing all along the sides of her at the water line to keep the ice cakes from cutting into the plankin. She was built with what they call dead rise. From down in, the, in her sides, from her water line down, she was built wedge-shaped so that if the ice came and tried to nip her, she would pop up on top of the ice and not get crushed. Her propeller was way down in the bottom of the stern there so that it would be protected from the ice. <clears throat> One of her most distinguishing features was the ice barrel way up on top of the foremast there. That's the barrel that the men, the crow's nest, the men used to go up. They scooch down inside that barrel, though they get out of the wind a little bit and watch for leads in the ice. That was the idea of it. I don't know if any of the guys are there, the maritime guys. Andy Chase, are you there? Unmute a minute, Andy. Are you there? I'm here. All right. Here. What's wrong with this picture, Andy? <laughs> they got the barrel on the wrong side. They got the, got the negative. barrel on the wrong side. Oh my God, how could that have happened? Somebody they must have. They got the negative it. reverse. <laughs> they reversed that negative. That's right. My gee. <laughs> Good for you. That ice barrel has quite a story. When, uh, when I got the vessel in 1967, I looked down in that ice barrel. And you know, the men that went up there, the seamen that went up, they always had a jackknife with them. And they sat in that barrel by the hour and they had nothing else to do. So they carved their initials on the inside of that barrel. And all of the crew members down over the ages, the 26 voyages Mac made up to the north, they carved their initials in that barrel. I th looked at that and I thought, my God, this is an artifact. This is a historic piece. I'm not putting that back up on the top of the mast. So I built a, a barrel exactly the same as that one. 
and I put it up on the starboard side. I put it up and uh, we saved that one, which I donated to the Maritime Academy. I did it before I had a museum. No, I'm not so sure. I didn't keep it. But that's, that's the story of that barrel. Anyway, the old the old Bowden fantastic vessel, the old Donald McMillan, he, of course, had, he had the outfit from the four years that he spent up in the north there. He had his sealskin parka and he had a polar bear boots and a, all of that, everything. You could probably eat his whole outfit and, and survive the Arctic winter. He got aboard the Bowden and they started out. He had a bunch of scientists with him, all of these ologists, biologists, and so, uh, all, well, all the ologists, seven of them. There were seven of them aboard and they set out on their first voyage on the old Bowden. And they made sailors out of themselves as well as scientists. Went up to spend the winter up in the, somewhere in the northern part of Greenland. Of course, going up Davis Straits, they ran into icebergs, incredible icebergs, and had beautiful, sometimes beautiful things to see. They were searching all along the coast up there, uh, up uh, Scott Sound, looking for a good place to lay the vessel for the winter time. They wanted to go in and stay the winter and do their their scientific research. So finally, they got way up in the top. You can see the track they, they went uh, along up through Smith Sound all the way up until they got up to Etah, which is the very most, so about the most northern port before you go into Cane Basin, which is a polar ice cap and really unnavigable in the wintertime. They found this little tiny place called Refuge Harbor way up on the north end there. And it was a beautiful little harbor, uh, a stark harbor. There, here's, here's a more modern picture of it. That's Greenpeace that happens to be there. But this is what they saw when they went in there in the summer when there wasn't any snow and ice around. Here they are, a beautiful little embayed harbor there, uh, good protection. The ice on wouldn't move, so they went in there and they plopped their anchor down. You can see out in uh, Cane Basin, you can see the icebergs out on the horizon there. And of course, they lay there until winter started to come. <clears throat> and the ice formed around in the harbor. It uh, was a little opening there where the Bowden lay. She jigging back and forth on her anchor chain. And uh, uh, of course, you can see around the sides there along the shore where the beach is, so the, the, the ice is all broken along where the beach is. Keep that in mind because there's 10 feet of tide here. They got themselves snug down, had a real nice berth there, and winter came on and things froze up tighter than a tick. Now, this is low tide. Notice out there between the ledges out there, there's a, there's a rock right in the entryway, right in the center of the entryway. Uh, remember that because we'll get back to that in a little while. And along the shore, you can see all around the shore, the broken, the broken water where the tide goes up and down. 10 feet of tide, the vessel drew 10 feet of water. Over in that headland over there, which gives them great protection for Refuge Harbor, you can see the tide line. It's about 10 feet down from uh, on, on the face of that bowl or that uh, piece. McMillan, of course, having spent four years in the Arctic, four years uh, with the Eskimos. He knew all of these people there and they all came up by swarms. They came down and they pitched their tent on the beach. They had all their dogs with them and they decided they would spend the winter with the Bowden in this particular spot. So uh, the cold came, the vessel iced in, right, uh, thoroughly iced in. And the Eskimos came down and they brought their dogs down and they picked up the, the scientists and they went over and they did their scientific work. They w wandered around all the mountains and the hills there and uh, had a grand time while the vessel snugged down and the but got colder and colder and more snowy all the time. And finally, they were able to bank the vessel up with snow all around her hull so they could keep her warm. And they built igloos over the openings on the deck. <clears throat> The igloos, of course, would allow ventilation down below. And also they tell me polar bears don't like igloos. They don't like to come into igloos. I don't know why. I never asked a polar bear. But that would keep it. Of course, they're down there cooking and the smells, every polar bear within 10 miles could smell that cooking down there. And I'm sure they must have been attracted to it. But that would keep them from going down below. Well, they faced the long cold winter there and did their research. And uh, of course, darkness came, 
and uh, the weather was sometimes fierce, absolutely fierce. But there they had their their little igloos, and they could snug down in the vessel, and they could keep warm there pretty well. They had a great coal stove down there, right in the forecastle. There are the men's berths up there. The forecastle was nice and warm, and of course. A uh, wooden vessel like that, down between the planking and the ceiling, there's an airspace, and that, of course, insulated the vessel so that uh, they survived pretty well. Then uh, the old cook there <clears throat> making dinner. I don't, I don't know if that's uh, Clayton Hudson or not, but he was the cook on there for many trips, and uh, that's the way they survived the winter. Well, of course, cooking on coal, they would come up and they would throw the coal over the side of the clinkers and the soot over the side. And that, of course, would draw the sun. Well, after they spent 330 days, 330 days of the winter, all through the wintertime, uh, spring was coming. Well, they were waiting for spring to come. Well, it was June, and then it was July, and spring hadn't come. And August, they, they still were locked in the ice in August. It melted around the vessel. You can see the snow around the bow has melted away from the hull. And where the soot was out there alongside, the sun would be drawn to that, and it freed the vessel up so that she was loose there. They looked up, they got up on the promontory there, and they looked out over Smith Sound, and uh, they saw that the ice had gone, and it was blue water out there. Oh, they wanted to get out of there, of course, after 300 days, 330 days, locked in the ice there. They wanted to heave that anchor up, and they wanted to get out of there, so they thought, well, we'll We'll get our saws out and we'll take some of those clinkers and some of that soot and sprinkle it under the bow. <clears throat> and they did. And then they got their saws out and they were sawing out two foot thick ice in front of the vessel until they could move the vessel ahead a little bit over towards the shore. Because with the tide going up and down, when the tide is down and the beach boulders are sticking up there on the beach, they're breaking the ice up. And then when the tide comes in, of course, it's all loose ice, just ice fans floating around there right on that little feather of water between the, the ice, the big pan ice on the, on the harbor and the beach. Well, that's 10 feet of water. They thought to themselves, if we could only get over into that little feather of water around the sides, at high water, we'd have water enough to move the vessel ahead. So that's what they did. They worked the vessel over, they got their anchor up and they were going around in that little feather of water but of course, it was only at the very top of the tide that they could move. And when they went around one pinnacle of ice there, all of a sudden the vessel stopped. Oh my God, they've got a ground. What are they gonna do? They, they wiggled the vessel back and forth. They did everything they could do to back her up, get off that pinnacle, but she wouldn't come. And then all of a sudden the tide, of course, was starting to go. The tide was starting to go down. They sounded off the bow, they sounded off the stern. They had plenty of water there but it was right in the middle of her, she was caught. So they thought, my God, we'd better take tackles out. We better put tackles on both sides of her, try and hold her upright, because if she fell over the wrong way, I don't know what would happen to her. So they took the tackles and they put it out on the ice out in the middle of the harbor, and they tried to take a little strain on her to keep her from falling over the other way. And then they took lines and tackles ashore and they tried to put them on the, on the beach there, on something secure, and they couldn't find anything really secure, and they couldn't seem to hold it, and the tide went out more and more, and finally the vessel hose herself down on her port bilge, and she stopped there, and their they seemed like the tackles were holding her. So they unloaded everything. Oh, my God, I forgot to tell you. The Eskimos, they wanted to take a ride on the boat, and so they all came out and they all jumped aboard Mac, of course, knew the whole deal. So come with us, guys. We'll take you around to Etah and you can disembark there. So they did. They brought 70 dogs. They brought 15 Eskimos. They brought 11 kayaks and four tents and four sleds, four or five sleds, all piled aboard the Bowden. So with a Bowden in this condition, unload everything. Unload everything you can carry back ashore because We've got to get rid of as much weight as possible. The poor old vessel will never come up if she gets over on her side with all this stuff piled up on deck. So they unloaded all their barrels, unloaded all their equipment, all these kayaks, all these dogs, everything out on the ice and, and over on the shore. And then the darn vessel, instead of staying in that position, 
there was just enough slack in those tackles. She fell. She fell stern first off of the boulder, backed up, stove one plank in down there, and lay on her side, pitched right over. And then they wondered, is she ever going to come up when the tide comes? And is her keel broken off? Was it caught in a rock down there? Is she navigable? Will she be navigable? I don't know. Down inside, it was in, untenable. Everything in the vessel was down on one side. Everything was, was just a, a complete disaster down below. Well, they went out on the ice. You can see them standing over there in the ice. They're waiting for the tide to come up. And they're watching. And the tide started back up. And it started up to the deck. It started through the scuppers. It came up over the rail and it kept coming and it came up to the combing around the house. It came up to the companionway. It covered, they caulked the companionway up to keep it from going down below. They shut everything up as tight as they could. The water came up right to the base of the mainmast and then it didn't come any higher. And they realized, my God, the vessel's coming up. And the vessel came up, and the vessel came up, and the tide came, and the vessel came up until the, the old schooner, the old boat, was right, bolt upright, standing right there just as proud as could be. But the tide was lower tide than the tide that she went aground on. 18 inches more the, the, to float the vessel, and they didn't have that 18 inches. Max said, geez, take up on the tackles on the shore. We got, we got to have her fall towards the shore, the shoal, more shoal water on that side the next time. And we have to wait till that next tide, the higher tide comes back in. So they set up the tackles on the other side and the tide went out and the vessel, it seemed like she had a pretty good berth there and she was more bolt upright than she is right now. They were able to get down and clean up down below and they got a fire going in the stove and they had a meal and so on. And then as the tide went out further, she found a new berth. She slid back further and their new berth and stove in two plank on the other side. Well, they weren't too worried about that. They had 20 ton of, of cement and boiler punching down in her bilge. And her bilge was right solid, full of cement. Uh, the water can't go anywhere. And the, the plank won't stave in as long as that cement will hold down there. There's no move in that cement. So they figured if she leaked a little bit, that'd be all right. The vessel lay like that until finally the tide back came back up. And as it came up, the vessel righted itself and they finally got her out of there and got her over along the shore and they moved her out. As I said before, with in this picture, you can see where the, where along the shore, where the ice is broken. They got all the way around until they were on that Southern headland over there, all poised to go out through where that rock is out through the channel and they were waiting for tide and they said, all right, guys, come aboard. Everybody come aboard and bring everything you can. All the Eskimos brought 70 dogs. They brought all their sleds. They brought all their tents. They brought all their gear and they loaded the Bowden up. And oops, I'm a little bit ahead of myself there. Back up, McMillan, back up. They, <laughs> they loaded the vessel up. And just as they were loading the vessel, it took them several hours to do that. They were just getting the, the Bowden filled up with all of the gear they intended to take her down to Etah. And a 16 million ton iceberg blew into that harbor, blew into the entrance of that harbor and completely shut it off. Here they were just trying to get out through that little, by that little rock and get out of there. And they think that iceberg was so completely form fitting for that harbor that McMillan said you couldn't paddle a kayak out between that rock and that iceberg. Oh, what are they going to do now? Well, the only thing they could do, there was just a neck of ice that stuck out from that berg and it stuck out and hit that rock. And it was a, a, a big, fairly big piece of ice. He said, well, we've sawed ourselves out of ice before. Let's see if we could saw that neck off of that iceberg. The wind, of course, out of Cane Basin, the wind was blowing that iceberg in, and half a gale blowing it in, so it was not going to move. But McMillan said, you know, if we cut that off, it'll break away, and this berg will come in, and we won't be able to get out because it'll just bury itself right in there. So he said, what we'll do is we'll carve with our saws two-thirds or three-quarters of the way through that neck of ice, and then we'll see if we can break it with the force of the boat. So they did, they sawed away and took them about half an hour, an hour, 
sawing down through that ice. They sawed down, sawed down until they finally got just at about, about 25, 30% of it was still hanging on. And they got aboard the Bowden. Everybody climbed aboard the Bowden. They had that one ice anchor out in the m middle of the stream. One guy stood there with the ice anchor. And as soon as, the, as soon as they got their engine going, they had an old Fairbanks Morse, 30 horsepower, one of these semi-diesels in her back in those days that goes boom, 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 you know, and blows great smoke rings out the stack. Anyway, that's what they had for an engine, and they fired that thing up, and they got it warmed up, and she was chugging away there, chugging away there, and he gave the signal, and the guy grabbed that ice anchor, unshipped it, and ran for the Bowden. They put the Bowden into gear. They ran for that neck of ice sticking out there, and they bashed into it as hard as they could, that old metal plating around her stem, bashed into it as hard as they could, and it cracked. And McMillan held the throttle right down as hard as he could, and the engine it, it's you could feel it shaking the back of that vessel boom 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 and digging into that cold water down there he said you could feel the power every turn of that propeller and every time it hit it banged into that ice a little bit more and broke it a little bit further boom boom and finally it broke off and the boat went out through just as that bird swung in behind him and almost hit the stern of the vessel and they got out into the blue water and headed for eat oh my god some relieved Donald McMillan, some kind of an incredible captain. 26 voyages the man made above the Arctic Circle. 26 voyages, 250,000 miles, carrying scientists, carrying kids, carrying students, carrying everything you can imagine. 26 voyages, unmarked territory, unknown charts, unknown rocks, and everything else. Never lost a man, never hurt anybody seriously. Just so. Um, Incredible, incredible seaman. And the Bowden. The Bowden certainly deserves a lot of credit for what the, those fellows did. He turned around. He went right back up to the Arctic. So he, uh, he, he's not going to hang around civilization, not when there's the Arctic to explore. Back he goes again. They wintered in, in other places. They wintered in, in Labrador, Baffin Bay. They wintered in up in the uh, other parts of Greenland over and over again back to the Arctic and these incredible unknown places where he would find a place to, to stay and spend the winter. You can see the hides, some kind of animal they, were, they have hanging in the rig and they're drying in that particular uh, England. Uh, going aground over and over again. The poor old Bowden went aground so many times. Uh, you might have well called her part of the terrorist. She was just an amazing, amazing vessel and uh, just uh, they had such a terrible time in some of these harbors, getting off of the scientists off the shore and back again through the ice. My gosh. And in these little tiny harbors, going aground again, oh, over, over and over again. They never knew where the rocks were until they ran into them. Then they put them on the chart. But the old vessel always came home. She always came home. And on schedule. Unbelievable. They even did wonderful things for the, the Labradorians, the, the people they would come up to Maine, Maine uh, Labrador. They brought a schoolhouse up to Maine, Labrador one time, and they built a schoolhouse. The, the uh, Inuit language, the Eskimo language at that time uh, was a, only a spoken language, and they made the first Inuit dictionary. And then, of course, the Moravians up there, they looked at that dictionary and said, well, we've got to build a Bible. And they built a Bible, and we have a copy of it in the museum. Come and see. Written in the Inuit language. They took a Model T Ford up there one time on the Bowden. They put it ashore, made a snowmobile out of the thing, and they brought the firewood back from the woods uh, for all of the population of Nain. Lots and lots of things the Bowden did. Well, of course, McMillan, like all the rest of us, he eventually got pretty elderly too. And he finally decided he's going to have to retire. He's 80 years old now and taking his last voyage, took some uh, students and uh, young scientists up to the north for a summer cruise and uh, came back and decided he would lay the vessel up. Well, he didn't know what to do with the vessel. Uh, uh, the, nobody seemed to have room for it or want it. And uh, it lay around for four or five years until finally someone in Mystic Seaport Museum decided it would be a good idea to take the boat and we'd have, they could build an Arctic exhibit. So I thought, gee, that's a great idea. 
1959, Macmillan put a brand new mast in the vessel. He put all his charts and his gear aboard there, everything that he had, just as if he was going to Greenland. And he turned around and donated it to the Mystic Seaport Museum. Oh, what a great lot of hoopla. They had a mile long parade. It was just incredible, a boat parade and everything else that boat and arrives at Mystic Seaport. And it was just so wonderful. And a year later, they didn't give a hang about that vessel. She lay there for nine years. They never lifted a finger for her maintenance. She's an old vessel, elderly vessel by this time. And they never put any oil on her decks. They never did a thing. The poor old vessel started to rot out. Well, finally, about nine years later, a woman stepped down through their high heel through one of the four deck planking. Well, then with their infant wisdom, they closed the vessel, no more visitation on the Bowden, and they decided they'd take her apart. Oh, great, okay. Well, they took the mainmast out, took foremast out. They took the engine out. This is a Cummings diesel now. This is a nice modern engine they can all had it by that time. And they put it down on the beach where the sand was blowing through it. And they took the window, so they took all the hardware off of everything they could get off of that vessel. They took off of that vessel. Why would they do that? They were going to sink it. They were going to get rid of that vessel and sell the goodness off of it. McMillan's 95 years old, living in P-Town. He sees this happening. He says, my God, if I could get it away from Mystic, I'd find a new home for it. We've got to do something to save that vessel. I gave it to him for posterity, and they're going to ruin it. I called him up in 1967. I said, Mac, I have a dock up in Maine. I've always wanted to have a museum piece up there. He said, take her to Maine, Jim. Take her to Maine. Do anything you can with her. Do, do whatever you can do for the poor old thing. So I said, okay, we'll do it. And I got Ransom Kelly, a friend of mine who had the Magnum down in Booth Bay Harbor. I said, Ransom, will you throw the Bowden up to Camden for me? Yes, sir, I sure will. Never charge you a, a dime for it. He said, oh, that's my contribution. He came and picked up a Bowden. And we towed her off. I took as far as they had, they had broken the mainmast off, the head of the mainmast off, picking it up by the masthead, I guess. So I put the broken spar on deck there, and we took the dories, and we took everything that was laying around and uh, put it on board the vessel, and we towed her off. There we are going through, I guess that was Booth Bay. We stopped, stopped for a few minutes in Booth Bay. Oh, here we're going through the Cape Cod Canal. Anyway, we had all the gear and everything we could stash on board the poor old thing. And uh, there's one of the masts laying there, the whole length of the deck. And uh, we worked on it a little bit now and then. We finally got up to Maine, and I lay her alongside the wharf in Camden. That's what she looked like that first summer that I had her. I went up to the rails up there forward, and I just kicked on them, and they fell off down onto the float down below kicked the bulwark and it fell down on the floor. We took a piece of canvas and covered the stem over to try and keep the water from going down, rainwater from going down behind the stem and uh, cleaned her up a little bit. I put, uh, there she is laying alongside the adventure. I was running the adventure, of course, on the outside of the Bowden. We didn't have a place for the Bowden with depth enough except on the face of the dock. You can see down on the, on the top side, I took the uh, shear streak off of the boat in there and we put a piece of canvas over it to keep the rainwater out of it, to let her breathe all summer long down through the inside of her. And uh, in the fall, when we came back after our season on the schooner, she came out of the water two inches. That much, that much drying, she came out of the water two inches. Well, she hadn't been hauled. <clears throat> that was the first thing we did. <clears throat> Actually, I should say we did this before we did anything else, before I lay her at the face of the dock there and uh, kick the, the rail off, uh, I pulled her into the slipway. And uh, well, probably this is about the time John Foss arrived. John Foss was going to Bowdoin College at the time. And he came up and decided he would uh, come weekends and work, volunteer work on the Bowdoin. So uh, he came up and scraped paint off of her and helped us clean her up and all the rest. She hadn't been hauled in about a dozen years. She had barnacles the size of your fist on the bottom of her. We took a wire and took it over to a tree over there so she wouldn't fall the wrong way. She lay against the wharf there, and we let the tide go out, and we did her bottom for the first time. There she is doing tide work now. We're down there all scraping just as tight as we can go, a whole crew, 
And uh, you can see a piece of her boilerplate that she had around the stem there. That boilerplate was all rotting away, rusting away. We had to uh, tear it off of her. You can see the ironwood sheathing she had around her hull there. And uh, there's a better picture of ironwood sheathing. Everybody's down, both sides of us, scraping her down and cleaning her down. We had to get paint on her before that tide came. That's Orville Young back there, Captain Orville Young. He's going across the bar now, the loss of a great man. But uh, carving all of those great barnacles off of her stern. Anyway, we finally got her cleaned up. The tide came back, the vessel came back up again. And uh, th then we lay her out uh, for the <clears throat> layer out for the summer so that we could go to work on her that fall. The, uh, uh, that's the same picture. So we, put, we built a cover over her and we had uh, the same time we had that berth dredged for her right there. Back in those days you could have something dredged without getting four years of permits before you can lift a scoopful. But anyway, she drew 10 feet of water. We just had to make a little trough, a little uh, trough down under her so that she wouldn't ground out at low tide. But we built a cover over her and we went to work on her. First thing we did was replace some of the plank that we had to do for her. And uh, we uh, uh, dug into her frames there to see how bad she was. Actually, she wasn't all that bad. Uh, they were black and they seemed like they were scaly, but I think the frost must have done that because you get down into them and they're, they're pretty much the frame left down inside there. When they took the engine out of it, they never uh, cut a hatch or anything. They just ripped the whole top off of the main house. So the first thing we had to do on the bad days, we couldn't work outside. We put new house top on her. Then I had to replace the mainmast. I didn't have any money in those days. So I went up to Aroostook County. I went up to a place called Donkey Deadwater. You ever hear of that place? Donkey Deadwater, Maine. And uh, got a black spruce up there, 185 year, uh, year old black spruce, with three and a half feet in diameter, the butt, and a nice straight one. Well, of course, we're making a new mainmast now. The first thing you have to do is square it up. But it's straight and true. And uh, we had a two man chainsaw. You had to stay away from the line because that chainsaw going with the grain was pretty wild. But we got it straight and true and squared up. And then, of course, you, we got a we rented a big uh, skill saw. They didn't make skill saws that big for normal use, but we got one big one that we rented. We were able to cut the ears off and made it eight, eight sided. <laughs> there are the slabs over on the right side. And that's the old mass laying there. You can see she's got a little hook to her and so on. We got it eight sided. Once you get it eight sided, well, then of course you've got a 16 sided. Now this is all handwork. You have to do this with draw shaves and planes. You get 16 sides, you're getting closer to round all the time. Then you go for 32 sides, and there's Cappy. He's starting to get into the top of it. That's Cappy Quinn, Earl and Quinn. He worked for me for all those years. And finally, we get it to 64 sides, and they say any damn fool can plane it round once you get to 64 sides. So that's what we're doing, planing it round. So we made the new made the new mast. I'm cutting in the, the masthead there, the hounds where the cross trees go. We got the mast in, got her rigged up, and we got the foremast in, got that rigged up. Now we're getting ready. We're thinking about the trip down to salute McMillan. Now she's all rattled down and rigged up there and uh, getting ready to go. That, I guess the adventure must have been down to the shipyard or something there. That's Stephen Tabor laying out at the end of the dock. So we decided October 5th there, 1969, we decided to head out and salute McMillan, if at all possible. He's 96 years old now, and they had to get there before something happened to him, just as much as we could do. Well, anyway, we got we got the whole thing together, patched her up here and there, and uh, went uh, just enough so that we were seaworthy. And we went down to West Cass at first. He started here on the left, you can see, he started his 21, 23, and 25 expeditions from Wiscasset and several others besides that. So we had to go to Wiscasset. So there we are in Wiscasset, and there's the Luther Little and the, the Hesper, the two schooners that were there right by the bridge in the old days. Of course, they're gone now. That's my son, Topher, on his tether. He went on the trip with us. You can see a piece of canvas over the main boom there. There was a rotten place in it. We didn't have any time to put any Dutchman in it. We wanted to get going, but there was enough left of it so that we'd go sailing anyway. 
we had a visitor when we get, we went through Gloucester, got into Boston, and then Edgar Rose Snow came down. I never saw any man in my life talk as much as Edgar Rose Snow. He was there almost two hours and never shut his mouth the whole time. I don't think he even, even knew my name when he left, but he wanted to know all about our trip. So we're getting ready to go leave Boston and head across the uh, Mass Bay down Cape Cod, down to Provincetown. Uh, that's uh, my cook, Jan, on the bow. That's Spence Apollonio, our old fish commissioner of uh, Maine at the wheel. He went with us on that trip. We went out by uh, Boston Harbor and uh, got outside in dungeon thick of fog. Oh my God, thick of fog. And we heard in Boston there, there were 300 people waiting for us in P-Town, waiting for the Bowden to arrive. So we had to go. We didn't have any electronics. We didn't have anything but a compass and a lead line. And we hadn't swung the compass, hadn't been out long enough to swing the compass to know that it was even accurate. We took our departure from the sea buoy and headed for the beach where we thought McMillan lived. We weren't even sure where that was but we headed down through the fog and we were going along through the fog and searching, searching. Finally, we ran our time out. We got our lead line out. We were starting to sound, starting to sound. And uh, uh, we were 10 fathom, nine fathom, and, and, and by the mark seven and by the uh, five fathom and then by the deep four. Finally, he shouted out three fathom, chat, three fathom. I said, all right, that's it. We can't go any further. We're gonna go ground. So I swung the wheel over, we jived over. And I said, we'll have to give this up and go on over to the dock. And just about that time, we came into a corridor of clear air. I wouldn't believe it. Uh, they, they call me a liar, but I swear to God, it was a corridor of clear air. The vessel burst out in this clear air. We looked over and there was McMillan's house and there was Max standing on his porch, ringing his bell. He knew we were coming, he could hear our horn, and he was ringing his bell. Oh my God, he got a chance to say, it wasn't, it wasn't but about four let boat lengths, we sailed through that and back into the fog again. And then we went over to the, the wharf. And my God, that was intimidating. We went over to the wharf and there must have been 400 people on that wharf. And they're all shouting, welcome, Bowden, screaming their heads off, oh, hip, hip, hooray, and all that stuff gave me goosebumps. We went over and we tied up there and my God, the people came down in swarms. They came down, 200 of them came aboard, I swear. And I said, stop, stop, stop. We got to get some people ashore. I thought they were going to sink us. It was really an amazing time. We, we had a wonderful time uh, in Provincetown and uh, McMillan took us back to his house. That, my younger son there took us back to his house and showed us movies of the Bowdoin in the Arctic. And, it was just a wonderful experience. They called it a sentimental journey. So we sailed on back to Camden, tight as we could go. In order to get back, McMillan passed away seven months later. So it was the very last time we'd ever be able to get down and salute him. So we went back to Camden, put the boat back in her berth, and then we went to work. We had so many things to do to that boat to make it right. Her hull, I figured, was still in good enough shape. We we're going to use it the way it is. I'm not going to put her in cement like Miriam wanted me to. I'm going to use this boat. She's still able. Here we had to tear the foredeck off. We tore the brake beam out. And of course, this forward hatch that went down into the galley down there. You can see the smoke pipe up there on the deck, the two smoke pipes that came out of the old stove there. We tore the foredeck off. Uh, we put new new foredeck on her all the way right up to the eyes of her. You can see that. I had to dig down in the apron piece behind that stem. It was started to rot and I was able to take that apron piece out of there. We wouldn't need it for normal cruising. And uh, the stem was good behind all of that apron piece. It was so, so nice to know. But anyway, we then uh, patched her up again, uh, her hull. We put new stern and new transom in her and we put other pieces of uh, of a uh, plank in, we put a few pieces of frame in the side over there, uh, right there, a top, few top timbers in here and there. Uh, but for the most part, she was certainly able enough to be a, a darn good wind jammer, I would say for the next 40, 50 years. And we gussied her up and then I decided we'll, we'll take her sailing. We'll go sailing at the end of the season. I just couldn't get my, couldn't get enough of sailing. So at the end of the, in the end of the season, John Nugent and I used to take this boat out, just the two of us, 
and my wife would be down below with the two boys and she'd be cooking dinner and John and I would sail the boat. We would, we would set the mainsail, he'd get on one side and I'd get on the other and we'd get her the sail up about halfway and then we'd stall out so we'd make it fast. And then we'd both gang up on one halyard and jig that up and then we'd go over and get on the other halyard and that's the way it would go over and over again until we finally got all sail up on the vessel. I sailed her oh, many times up till Thanksgiving in the fall after the season was done on the adventure. We sailed all the way down to Cape Charles, down the bottom of the Chesapeake Day. We sailed up to Nova Scotia, around Cape Breton, and back down all, all over the main coast. Had a wonderful time sailing that vessel, and she was able. I put her through the paces in the Bay of Fundy a few times, and we had water all over the decks. But, uh, well, the McMillan says she'll always bring you home. She's like a like young colt sometimes. She's so lively. I don't know how they stayed in the forecastle when they had a real breeze of wind. But that's the way it was. We went in Gloucester one time in a, in a snowstorm, and I went and got the park of Spence Apollonio brought back from the Arctic for me, uh, just for photographs, you know. Each year we made her a little bit better. Each year we gussied her up a little bit more until finally she was fit for one of the Camden Windjammers. So Captain Alan Talbot came along. Alan, are you there? I hope you're, I hope you're tuned in. He's somewhere down in Florida at the moment. Uh, 1972 to 74, those three years, Alan uh, sailed the Bowden and uh, she just looked handsome, handsome vessel and certainly uh, able, able vessel. This is 1975, uh, Camden Harbor, we had a whole whole parcel of old rotten wood around Charles Wharf. Then you can see my little tugboat there, the wrestler, and behind it, of course, the adventure, along as a country mile, all covered up there for the winter. Behind the adventure is the roseway. You can see her black masts sticking up there with no mastheads on them. We just got the roseway, 1975, and tied her up inside the adventure. There's the Bowden up in the slipway. You can see her ice barrel up on the foremast. And the Stephen Tabor over P.G. Willies with the the Columbia Bud Hawkins boat behind, and of course, Bill Rain's lobster boat, the Bog Onion right there. <laughs> and he's got a skiff there he called Taint Much. <laughs> he certainly was a piece of the waterfront there in Camden. And uh, John Nugent, John Nugent, uh, of course, came uh, when we were walking, uh, working on the Stephen Tabor, fitting her out one time. And he came, he didn't have a place to stay. We let him stay on the Stephen Tabor. So he hung around, hung around, hung around. He had a lot on his mind. Anyway, then when we went sailing, I said, John, would you ship keep on the Bowden for us? And we, he said, sure. So he did. He came over and he took care of the Bowden while we were out for the summer. And then he fell in love with the Bowden. And when we came back uh, and worked on the Bowden, he would go to work on the Bowden with us. And, and pretty soon he knew the Bowden just as much as I knew the Bowden. So he had her from 1976 to 85, all through a rebuild, which he did. He did. Actually, when they, when he first uh, uh, got the boat together, they were trying to fit it, get it fitted out as a training ship, and uh, they didn't know what to do for the Coast Guard. Nobody knew what to do. And Ed Morse came to me and he said, Jim, who, who do you know that would go captain on the boat? And I said, oh, get John Newton. He knows as much about that boat as I do. He sailed with me all the time. So John, by that time, I think had gotten his license or at least he was on his way to do it. And uh, he went captain of the Bowden and then they put her up and they did that rebuild at Bath and oh, it's a long, sad, terrible sort of story. But uh, in the end, they, uh, shall we say, let him go. They used him up and then let him go to bed. But uh, John loved that boat and he, would, he was a perfect match for it. Bill Cowan came along in 1985 and he, he ran the boat for them uh, as a training ship. Uh, there's some kind of a, uh, in the regulations, there's some kind of an exception for a training ship. Because when I went to the Coast Guard and wanted to get her certified, they said, well, you had to rebuild her. You had to put watertight bulkheads in her. You had to take this hatch out and that out. I said, no, she's too historic a boat. I don't want to do that. So then Miriam and I had so, so many words about my using the boat and sailing her all the time, because that's the only way you can keep a boat going. Anyway, I gave it back to the Bowden Association, and then they got uh, these other people to run it. Uh, captain Kate Cronin, who uh, worked for me uh, in the galley for that, she was captain a couple of years there. And then finally, 
Andy Chase came along and Maine Maritime Academy came to their senses and they decided the Bowdoin would be a terrific training ship. So now Andy, I'd like you to unmute there and, and uh, tell us how you got the Bowdoin and you bought the Bowdoin with drug money. <laughs> Jim. <laughs> well, now I heard that, I heard that from somewhere. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> there. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, it, it came, <laughs> we, we found out that, um, we found out that they were looking for a new home that, uh, Hurricane Island had her for a few years there, and, and, uh, Hurricane had decided that it didn't really fit their model. They didn't really, uh, want to continue, and so, um, well, uh, Maine Maritime decided to take it over. It started with a student named Chris Cluck who uh, circulated a petition at a fire drill in a blizzard in the middle of the dorm courtyard and uh, got, uh, I don't know, a couple of hundred students to sign this thing and saying that it would be a great idea. Most of them didn't have any idea what they were signing, I think. But um, anyway, the school decided to take it on. And for the first year, I think we had it on a $1 a year lease or something. And uh, it was uh, Ken Curtis was our president at the time. And he had the foresight to realize that this was a really perfect fit uh, for the school. Um, I was in there as an agitator and, and uh, said that would be a good thing to do. And, but um, as far as taking over the ownership of the Bowdoin, uh, they had an outstanding debt. Had about eight hundred thousand dollars. Small, small matter they had to take care of. Yep. Yeah. But we we had um, being a state institution, uh, the federal marshal's office had given us a confiscated Swan seventy, I think it was, big Swan yacht that had been busted full to her hatches with uh, marijuana, and um, they donated it to the school. They'd emptied it first but they couldn't get the smell out of it. And um, we were, the school was able to sell that for just about that amount of money. And all that money went into paying the debt, the outstanding debt on the Bowdoin. So it was Ken Curtis who always said that it was drug money that bought the Bowdoin. And uh, <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> well, confession's good for the soul. I'm glad you told that story. <laughs> Yeah, well, the Bowdoin's kept quite busy there now. Um, have we got have we got some more of the crew there? Can you tell us where where you took her when you went up? You went up, sure, uh, along the Greenland shore. I'll start and take. I'll start and pass it on to the others. Um, so I got on her. Uh, we we got the boat in '87. It was around Thanksgiving time, and sailed her up from Rockland in a magnificent breeze and uh, brought her in alongside and stripped her down. It was, uh, you know, end of season, so we stripped her down and put a cover on her and then um, spent the winter scheming and um, hired Elliot Rappaport as my mate, who had been a student of mine at SEA uh, on the westward. And he'd done quite a few things in the interim. And we uh, worked on the, uh, an idea of what to do. And, I suggested to Ken Curtis that, you know, this was a northern boat. Maybe we could just every year take her a little bit further north, just, just a little further, even if it's a mile or two. Let's just keep pushing the, pushing the envelope further north. And he thought that was a great idea. So the first summer, um, we did a two-week trip up to Halifax and back, which technically is probably 10 miles north of Castine, but um, psychologically it's north anyway. <laughs> and uh, that was a great opportunity to take her offshore and get a feel for the boat and understand what she could do and understand that she could do anything, actually, and uh, understand a few things that we wanted to do to the boat to uh, make it uh, accommodate a few more students. And so uh, we kind of laid out the ideas and the plans. And that winter, over the course of that winter, Elliot did all the carpentry work down below, 90% of it. And uh, installed more berthing, uh, duplicated the four berths that were on the port side, I guess, and, and installed them on the starboard side or vice versa. Um, and we fitted out, um, anyway, we, we fitted out the layout as it is now and uh, put in a new galley and such. And then so that uh, somewhere along the line in that fall or winter of 80, 
eight um, or 89, I guess it was, I don't know, lost track. Um, but I said to Ken Curtis, I said, you know, I was looking at some of Macmillan's logs and realized that um, according to the mileages that he covered, we could get all the way to Red Bay, Labrador and back again in a six week trip in the middle of the summer. And Ken Curtis just said, do it, sounds great. And I couldn't believe it. I was a, a little, <laughs> uh, maybe a little trepidatious even, but um, seemed like a good idea at the time. So we laid that trip out and um, did it. Um, but we went past Red Bay. We decided we could go all the way up to Nain. So we went up to Nain, Labrador and back the first year. And on the way back from that trip, I started drawing pictures in books of this, uh, another trip and thought, God damn it, in nine weeks, we could get to Greenland and back. And um, <laughs> by then the Bowden had won me over. I, I realized that that Bowden would take you anywhere. And, and I was 100% confident in the boat. And uh, so Ken Curtis, again, he just smiled and said, I think it's a great idea. Go for it. So in 90, so the, let's see, the Labrador trip was in 90. Uh, and the Greenland trip was in 91. Um, Where's, where is this picture taken? This picture is taken in Sonderstrom Fjord, about halfway up the Greenland coast. Um, coast. Yeah. Uh, this is the fjord that Bowdoin surveyed in World War II when the... Uh, U.S. wanted to build an airbase in Greenland to make uh, tra travel back and forth to the war uh, feasible, uh, give the airplanes places to stop along the way. Yeah. So uh, they took the, sent the Bowdoin up there with Stu Hotchkiss as captain, who was a young lieutenant in the military who had sailing experience. And mm -hmm. he spent a winter sailing in Greenland up there, a winter sailing in Greenland. <laughs> surveying this fjord and a couple of other fjords um, for the military. And so we wanted to make this trip up here because we were going to have Stu join us on the return trip. When we got back to Bradour Lakes, Stu had driven up from Connecticut and came aboard at age 80 something. And he sailed with us back to Castine. And so we had these pictures to show him. Every day was as pristine as this, I guess. Huh? Uh, well, actually, remarkably, there's a lot of nice weather up there. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a bunch of bad weather in between, but you get quite a lot of nice weather up there, um, often as not. So that was, uh, that was my last trip. I, I turned it over to Elliot at that point, and uh, so I will turn it over to Elliot. Elliot, there's take no, over. There's enough wind to blow your hat off there. <laughs> yeah, for, fortunately, this, this picture was taken on one of Andy's trips, but um, yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, early, I guess it was 91 was the year that we went up to Greenland for the first time, uh, went back to Greenland for the first time. And, um, you know, there was a certain sense of momentum. I think everybody was discovering uh, everything that the boat could still do um, and uh, really how good she was for a, as a training platform for the academy. Um, you know, so there was rapid talk of, you know, bringing the boat back and, of course, trying to go even farther. Um, and, uh, you know, right about that time, uh, Andy and I had a conversation that went something like, well, you know, I've, uh, just gotten married and, uh, I'm kind of interested in getting back to a full-time job on the faculty. So why don't you take the boat? Um, and, uh, you know, like everybody else in that situation, I sort of swallowed hard and, um, you know, we had a year or two of, uh, going back and forth to the Maritimes. I think we went up to Newfoundland, um, a couple of times. And then in the summer of 1994, uh, we went back to Greenland, of course, had to go even farther. I think we had, uh, we had set an objective for ourselves of getting up, up and over the 70th parallel. And I think in, in 1991, we made it as far as, as Disco Bay, which is the famous location of that, um, the, uh, the fjord that's responsible for something like three quarters of the icebergs in the North Atlantic. So we'd already crossed that off our list. So we wanted to go up to the next fjord, which is a, a place called, uh, where uh, there was a place called Rink Glacier, which was a glacier that uh, Macmillan actually landed on several times in his day and so we we took the boat up there and uh, the uh, you know I've never seen so much ice um, and there's a few pictures from that trip that made it into wooden boat and it just looks like a big mountain lake filled with icebergs it's uh, you know one of many things that you know I've never seen anything like it um, and uh, yeah we saw a little bit of weather on the way you know, on the way back uh, it looked like that but over the next uh, I guess I was aboard the boat uh, as captain for a total of about 10 years. And over that time, 
uh, it was really interesting after some, you know, a few years of just figuring out, you know, trying to convince people of exactly what the boat was doing at, at the academy and what it was meant to do. Uh, sort of in parallel with that, they were developing a much more active program design for the, for the small boat industry. Um, and Bowdoin really over the time that I was there um, really developed a toehold and ultimately sort of became the training vessel, one of the primary training vessels for that program. Uh, so uh, right about the time um, I moved on, which I guess was in um, around 2002, um, you know, she had uh, begun to take regular trips just as a, yeah, a routine. In fact, to the point where uh, students who were in cadets who were in that program, um, they were, uh, you know, they were obliged to, uh, to do a training cruise on Bowdoin as part of that. So it was, uh, you know, a really interesting 10 years of, uh, you know, adventure and also just finding, uh, finding a home for the boat at the academy that would really allow her to continue there. And it's been, I think, you know, after me, I think, uh, Rick Miller, who I think is also here, he's smaller than I remembered him, but I think I see him, um, and uh, several others. Uh, Heather Stone, who I think I also see, who was Captain Media after I was. Uh, you know, thanks to it's all. It's really been the story of the, the entire story of the boat's life is the the conjoined effort of a whole series of uh, you know skilled and skilled and lucky people to to keep her moving along. I'll throw in just uh, briefly here that uh, by the way, Elliot is the longest serving captain of the boat, and besides McMillan. <laughs> is that John worth talking? No, that was Andy. Oh, that was Andy. Okay. <laughs> Jim, and we have a question yeah. from we have a question from somebody asking how these photos were taken. Those are some pretty amazing photos in those storms. Who was doing that? Uh, I can address people behind one by one. <laughs> I can address that on the and this one the the uh, these two pictures right here. Uh, on my trip in 91, uh, and also again on Elliot's trip in 94, we had along with us a professional photographer, um, as you can see, who was pretty darn good and also pretty darn determined. Um, he did uh, just incredible work. He, it was, of course, in the days of shooting film, he brought a shopping bag or, or trash bags full of film on board. He brought 300 rolls of film and um, shot all the magnificent footage that we got. Uh, was done by him. Um, this picture here and the ones like it uh, and that one there were taken in 2005 um, on a separate trip. And in this picture, these pictures were taken from our training trip from the state of Maine that rendezvoused with us south of St. Pierre um, as we were crossing from Sable Island over to Newfoundland and uh, had a fairly breezy day there. And actually, I want to say that the, we're hove to in these pictures. It's about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. It's first light. And the training ship came over the horizon. And um, the only reason we were hove to is because we had to wait for them to catch us. They couldn't catch us. We were tearing us, <laughs> just tearing along. And so we stopped and waited for them to catch up. And then the idea, I thought, was that they would, we would sail along in company for a little while. And they'd take some pictures, maybe take some movies. But I got a call from the captain after about 20 minutes. And he said, well, we're rolling kind of a lot. People are kind of uncomfortable. We're going to take off. We'll see you later. <laughs> and so, but fortunately, there was a student uh, on board that took all these pictures. Well, they're pretty close to that cliff right there, that cliff of ice. Yeah, that, that was... That, that was one of the big ones. That was one of the big ones. It goes up quite a bit further than that picture shows, too. Yeah. Who's, who's this? Okay, that is a, a woman named Katura Paulson in um, Elliot, which, wait, is it Sissimiat? Anyway. Yes. There's a, yeah. 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 Um, we pulled in, in each of these towns that we'd pull into in Greenland, this was in 91, we would drag out these National Geographics that we had from the 50s and 30s and 40s, you know, 20s even, and um, pass them around to local people and say, do you recognize anybody in these pictures? And when we did this in the Sissimiat, a uh, gentleman came, looked over his shoulder and said, oh my God, that's Katura. She's up the hill right now. Let's go get her. And, <laughs> and better yet, uh, Tom Stewart said, let's recreate this picture. So the the one she's holding, the two that she's holding on the left, um, the one in her left hand is herself in the 20s. I can't remember what year exactly. 
uh, taken by Macmillan or his photographer. And then they came back a subsequent year, a few years later, and set up the same picture, set up that picture to the left and took that picture. And so Tom Stewart said, well, let's go do that. So we found the same spot. She got all dressed up in her traditional garb and uh, we set that same picture up. And I think Elliot, was she no longer there when you got back up there again? Yeah, when we went back up in uh, 1994, she had passed. I think yeah. just that year. Yeah. yeah. So that was pretty sweet. And While we're other, at it. What's the other picture there? So Okay, so that picture there is Bowdoin Harbor, Labrador. And that's the cairn that Mac built in 1936. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yep. And that's the harbor that we saw a polar bear in, too. The only, the only polar bear we saw. That was right after we saw the polar bear. We went in there and spent, you know, a day. It was blowing a gale and a half. We spent like a day hanging on for dear life, both anchors. And finally, you know, the wind led up to about 40 knots. And Andy said, well, I think it's probably a good time for you to take some people ashore to visit the cairn. And that felt to me like about an hour after the polar bear had come by to take a look at us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's great. <laughs> well... As so well you don't have to run faster than all your friends, just one of them. <laughs> That's right. Is Will on there? Anywhere? Yeah, he's here somewhere. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Hey, Jeff. hey, Will. Well, just wanted to thank you again for that little jaunt you gave me that time you visited Rockland. We yeah, have... we, should, uh, we should do it again soon. Well, I think that'd be a great idea. We had a little reception there and Will took us out for a sail, and God, we had a whole hat full of wind, and it was a beautiful day. That uh, brought back a lot of memories. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. terrific. <clears throat> well, Jim, you had um, <laughs> Jim, um, yes. Andy, uh, Andy Platt is here on uh, here, and his father was on board Bowden a couple of times, and he wants. I was to... just, uh, was just going to ask him if yeah. he's there. Yeah. Yes. Well. Um, I just like to say, my, our uh, father Rutherford Platt uh, was not one of the younger crews, but he went on the 46 and the 54, the last trip. And out of his trips came uh, some articles in National Geographic and Scientific American uh, as the onboard naturalist. And there are two Rutherford Platts on this call tonight. One is my brother, Rutherford Platt, who's also an Arctic buff of sorts. And my son, Rutherford Platt, who graduated from Bowdoin in 96. But the two quick stories. One is, I was at the uh, helm of the Bowdoin at age of 10, going to Nova Scotia. Didn't get to go all the way north. And I was so excited to hear that there was a college named after a schooner that <laughs> I had it in mind and I applied to it. And I had a recommendation, the last one written by Donald McMillan, calling me a good lad and so on. And I went to Bowdoin, and there's several Bowdoin people on this, on this call tonight. But what I'd like to do is really send out a tremendous tribute and thanks uh, to you, Jim, because I remember we knew McMillan, the McMillans, they were so upset uh, with what was happening at Mystic. Uh, Miriam was in tears, and they just didn't know what they were going to do. And then you, I mean, seriously, no exaggeration, you saved the Bowden. None of the, these captains who have just spoken would be able to speak if you hadn't done what you had done. Here, and here, here. Yes, absolutely. Um, and just finally on this, I believe the McMillan came to the canal. He didn't have very good vision but he had the first smile on his face that he'd had for a long time. And so Jim, not only for this wonderful presentation, but for everything you have done to, to really rebirth the Bowdoin and get it to continue to be a wonderful, viable sailing uh, you know, ship and all of what's connected to it. So Jim, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Andy. I, I'm humbly proud that I was able to do something for the Yeah.
So hey, hey Jim, I can fill in a little bit, a little hole here. Um, you have a hole between 2001 and 2003, and that was the tenure that I was there as uh, captain. Say that again. Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, say that again that you said, Heather. What was it? Um, the hole that you have here between 2001 and 2003 in the Captain Continuum, that was the year that I was, the years that I was there. Oh, 2001, okay, okay. Yeah. I'll put that in there. Heather Stone, I'll get that in there. I wasn't sure about these dates. Are the rest of the dates about right? Jim, right. Jim, if I could just throw in two cents worth. Uh, I, I took it over from Heather. She had uh, kept the boat in great shape. Uh, I just want to say thank you also for this history. Uh, you, you tell stories better than anyone. Yeah. It, it, that was amazing uh, that you did. You pulled her from the, the depths of hell, and she's managed to survive. I think one of the things that's really, really amazing is the marriage to Maine Maritime Academy. Um, and, and I had the privilege of taking out with me uh, Max Boys from the 56 trip which yep. was Dr. Morris and Pete Rand. And the thing that really hit me when I had all of those gentlemen on the boat was how the boat has survived in a very, very similar way to what he had designed. You know, we carry students um, and they get training that is unbelievable. And these Max boys were all students in, you know, a lot of the Ivy Leagues and, uh, some of them actually changed their careers by their time on the, the schooner with Admiral McMillan. Um, so my, my tenure on the boat, one of the things that keeps chiming in is, is how amazing it is, all of the students that we've carried through Maine Maritime and all that McMillan did uh, that keep that boat alive. Uh, Will McLean was uh, my mate, and now he's taking care of that boat in a, a fashion that, uh, that you would be very, very proud of. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much for this great presentation, and it's really cool. There's a lot of people that love that boat. Like, thank you all for listening. I, I'd like to give some of the credit to John Nugent, because without John Nugent, the boat would have gone to the devil as well. He worked, he worked like a dog for that tenure that he was aboard there, and uh, nobody put more heart and soul into it than John Nugent. So I'm very proud to see the vessel in good hands now, and so proud to have her doing her thing, it is really a success story. Nobody, nobody is embarrassed about a success story. <laughs> Jim, I have a, another question and a comment here that are online. Somebody's, um, somebody wanted to give credit to the photographer who took the Greenland photos, and that was Tom Stewart. Mm -hmm. And then an, another question, um, somebody was asking how you funded the first refit after Mystic. Well, out of my pocket. <laughs> I was running the adventure at the same time and we were making money with that I didn't have any money I, you know, we did everything by guess and by golly uh, there's another comment here that Eric Jorgensen was a Bowdoin captain between Rick Miller and Will McLean Yeah, Robin and uh, Jim, I'll chime in just for a second. It's Rick Miller here. Um, yeah, so I sailed mostly with uh, when John Worth was captain, but uh, John and I, uh, in my tenure, kind of split a lot of the detail. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be the uh, most recent captain to take the boat north. And um, at that time, when that, there was talk about heading north again, it had been about 14 years, I think, since the boat had been north. And uh, the message was that there's no way it's going to happen if, if we propose that as the, the crew of the boat. So the students put the proposal together and took it up to uh, uh, the administration. And it was the students who actually got the approval to uh, do our 2008 trip. Um, and that was a, a trip from uh, basically the same uh, port stops that McMillan and then uh, Andy Chase and Elliot made on their trips north as well. And uh, I'll just give you one little story. We went into uh, Alilisit, which is right next to that fjord that Elliot had mentioned. And uh, we had, it was pretty much iced in, but uh, we saw a boat come out. So we said, well, yeah, we can get in there. And we did. 
and they said the harbor was ice free. Well, ice free is a different meaning to the, uh, the locals than it is to us, I guess, because it was chock a block full of ice. Um, and we tied up there, and the wind blew out of the west, and we were basically iced in. And a little Danish cruise ship came in, and the captain came over and said he had sailed on the Denmark as part of his training. If could he get a tour of the Bowdoin? So I gave him a tour, and he said, how are you going to get out of here? I said, I, I don't know. He said, well, I'm leaving tomorrow. If you want to follow us out, stay right on our stern, and we'll get you out of here. So we went through four miles of ice with him pushing with a reinforced bow to, to get out and really? uh, headed up and around Disco Island and then uh, started our trip back. But uh, Bowdoin is an amazing vessel. And as uh, John and uh, Elliot and Andy have said, the students of Maine Maritime are really to the credit of uh, keeping the boat what it is and uh, keeping it going. I don't know if everybody's her, watching. The, yeah, I don't know if everybody's watching the chats that are going on. Um, Jenny Butler is here and she said to thank everyone for the work to keep her afloat. The stories are amazing. My grandfather, Harvey Gamage, helped build her as part of his apprenticeship at, Har at Hodgson Brothers before he started his own shipyard. So there's a story that goes back to the early, early days. Wow. They well, had, when, they, when John Nugent was rebuilding her, uh, they got some of the crew from Hodgson Brothers to come over and, and help uh, tear her apart and start the rebuild. And they all said, oh, it, it's foolish to do. We, we throw her away, throw her away and build a new one. Uh, this is ridiculous. So that they, they didn't come back. John Donna was left there by himself and, and he did it all by himself. Tore the frames out of that boat and put them back in again. Anyway, one little, uh, one little uh, commercial here before we go. <laughs> uh, see, 40 years of voyage and all these sea stories here. You might want to take a little Dramamine when you read this book, but it's got a lot of great stuff in it. 40 years, 40 years of this, this boat and that boat all around Camden. Just uh, drop a $20 bill to the Sail Power Steam Museum, a little contribution, and you get a free book all signed. God, what a deal, huh? You really should take a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, the next one, the next, the next Zoom. Here is the next Zoom. Coming attractions. We're going to do the uh, Schooner Roseway. Of course, everybody knows the Roseway. Been around there. Uh, she, of course, was pilot boat in Boston, and uh, uh, Captain Norval Young and I and Alan Talbot, we all uh, converted her and made a windjammer out of her. And now she's part of the World Ocean School teaching kids, these great schooners that are teaching kids, it's great feather in their cap. And then we're gonna continue on down through with the, the whole Windjammer fleet out of Camden and Rockland. If we can keep up the pace, every two weeks we'll have a different one. So we sure appreciate your coming to this one. And with this will be on YouTube, come to our website and you can get the links to uh, any and all of these programs and YouTube as well. Any other questions anybody has? Anybody else want to chime in here? Well, I guess we've about covered it then. Okay, well, thank you all for coming and uh, come back and see us again. Come to the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum and see South Rockland's finest maritime museum. Thank you, Jim. Thank, thank you, Jim. Jim. That was great, thank you, Cap. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Chris and Barbara say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you, Captain. Thanks, thanks to all the Bowdoin guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Doug. Thank yeah, you. there you go. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, all my friends. <laughs> hey, Ed. All right, we'll be by next year. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Bye, everyone.